thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so this session is Funding, Scaling and Sustainable Growth, and we have three speakers. Uh, first up is Lucia Casalet from um, Fundacion Avena in Mexico. We also have Helen Turek, a senior researcher at the uh, Open Government Partnership. Sorry, senior regional coordinator at the Open Government Partnership in Germany. <laughs> And Brenda Knowlton, who's the lead digital architect in the government digital service in the UK. So each of them will be speaking for around 20 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So we'll begin with Lucia. Hello, everyone. A pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Tic Tac, so I'm very... I'm very pleasure to be here. I will try to speak slowly because in Latin America we speak very quickly and speaking in English is not good. So I will try to speak very, very slow. Uh, I will present some lesson learned about uh, a program, an alliance called uh, the Latin American Alliance for Civic Technology, ALTEC, we call it, that works in Latin America. Um, and, but I will start for the beginning. I'm Lucia, I'm um, a Uruguayan that lives in Mexico and work for an international foundation that's called Avina, that works for um, sustainable development in Latin America. Basically, from Latin America to Latin America. So we've been like working in Latin America for 25 years. And this is Altec. And Altec, support uh, the development of, really supports the improvement in, in citizen participation uh, using technology, but seeing the technology not as a end. It's more like seeing like, like a vehicle uh, to change public practices and private practice to um, accelerate impact. And when you think about, about our work in five years, you think, I oh, don't know, we have supported uh, 50 projects in 11 countries of Latin America, working with different governments, CSOs, media, uh, between all those countries, and you think about diversity. You think about different realities, different languages, working with uh, people from the cities, people from rural areas. But the real thing is that this is our how the, our community looks like. Uh, in generally, civic tech and transparency community in Latin America is pretty homogeneous. We are talking about men and women from cities that have PhD and masters uh, and have been working a lot with transparency and accountability. That is quite different to think in a very diverse and inclusive process of participation. That is what we need when we think about the challenges of our democracy today. So we started to think a lot, uh, like two years ago, how we can uh, get a more diverse participation in the civic tech field in Latin America, how to increase the engagement of uh, rural areas about women in, in, in different countries of the region. And most of the, more, more than the 50% of the population in Latin America uh, are women. And, the percentage of participation of women in Latin America is very slow because of violence, poverty, access to quality education. So we decided to start specifically to try to have an inclusive gender perspective in the develop, develop, developing of technology. Sorry for that. Uh, so, but it's so difficult how to create an inclusive participation without inclusive organizations. Uh, if you have like a very homogeneous set of organization, it's difficult to, this organization engage different type of population. So we started to start with almost 
30 organizations in 12 countries of Latin America to understand how to, or where, what was the feasibility to incorporate gender perspective. So we make a very long study and an experiment that takes almost one year, uh, trying to understand the feasibility to uh, institution feasibility, how the, the institutional um, where to incorporate a gender perspective, the hierarchical, the hierarchical position, the culture, also the political feasibility, how the leaders of the organization could be open to incorporate this perspective. Uh, also the technical, if the organization has the technical uh, knowledge to incorporate a gender perspective and a more inclusive perspective of technology, also the operation of feasibility. Uh, if they have the, the mean, mean to evaluate, to really concrete like economics uh, res resources to try to implement uh, this type of policy. And after that, we realized five myths about gender and inclusive technology that I would like to share with, with you. The first one is that, in general, when we talk about gender and technology, the first things that we talk and we say is that when you have in, 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 the, in the team of the organizations some members that know about gender, that means that they the project, the organization, or even the event has a gender focus or is more inclusive because in some way we talk about gender. That is completely false. Uh, the gender equality must be explicit to different means and for that it's necessary that people train and uh, develop different process inside the organizations. Also, another thing that we hear a lot when we're talking about technology and citizen participation is that if we have in a room, for example, um, a workshop or an event or, I don't know, uh, a campaign, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of women's and this project is automatically gender focused, also in campaigns, no? Uh, most of the, uh, the person in the campaign were women, so the campaign was uh, gender focused, so have an inclusive, inclusive perspective. And that is completely false, because uh, the organization, uh, the, the, um, it's, it's impossible to, to compare, to have women in, women in a room and to be able to create a more inclusive process. To create this inclusive process, you have to think about dynam dynamics and re review the relation of powers between the different uh, people involved in this process. Um, the third one uh, is the willingness of a team of an organization to implement a gender vision in technology or an event is sufficient. And sometimes, and I see it a lot with government, uh, they want to create uh, an inclusive uh, way to participate. But if you don't create an, the, the right mechanism, specialize with specific protocols that take in account the difference in access to participations between men and women, this process is not gender focused and is not inclusive. Um, the fourth, uh, organization that what works towards citizen participation or from the perspective of rights automatically promote the gender approach. We work a lot with human rights organizations in Latin America that all the time are thinking about protecting rights. But that necessarily not mean that these have a gender perspective or, the, or, or to have a more inclusive perspective. Perhaps we are talking about uh, protecting access to information, but no are thinking to have like a diverse access to information from the 
women in the south of Chile uh, to the women in Brazil. Um, finally, the gender perspective is only part of the the gender perspective is not only a, a part of the feminine, feminist agenda, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a collective construction. So it's not related to be a feminist. And to create and to have more inclusive technology, don't have to be involved with, with feminists. And finally, for, for us, at, at, the begin, at, at the end of this whole process of experimentation, is to recognize that technology is not neutral. And if, you, if we want to scale civic tech, uh, we must to take in account that technology reflects our priorities, our preference, uh, our prejudices, and it's crucial to, to take in account this to really co-create more inclusive and a scaling process of participation. I think here in Latin America and also around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Helen Turek. I'm working for the Open Government Partnership. Um, I have some slides as well, if we could bring those up in a second. Um, yeah, it's my first time here at Tech Tech as well. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, not my first time at the OECD, but <laughs> um, I'm really here to learn and sort of soak up um, some of the information from the civic tech community, because this is quite new for me. Um, and with this presentation, I hope to give you some ideas about how uh, we can use OGP and open government approaches to support some of the work that you're doing and some of the projects um, associated with civic tech. Um, I've heard on a few occasions um, that the open government and civic tech communities are not well integrated. And I think this is an interesting thing because I imagine if you were to look at a Venn diagram of the two communities, there would be an obvious overlap. But I think we just haven't got around to sort of filling in the details of that, what that overlap looks like. Um, and I'm, I'm keen to you know, build those build those connections, um, because technology is really an important part of OGP's work. Um, we have the ambition to make governments more responsive, inclusive, and open, um, with the idea that uh, a more open government, which allows public input and oversight, is more credible and, and is more effective. And when we're talking about values like transparency, accountability, participation, it's really technology and civic tech projects that can bring that to life and make that very concrete. So through apps and through portals and platforms and really translating that into more information for the public, holding governments accountable and providing space and opportunity for participation. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give you um, some examples of really interesting civic tech projects that have taken place as part of the OGP process. And I want to um, explain how being part of that process helped to catalyze something or bring something extra and give a bit more impact. Some of you have probably heard about some of these examples before, but I want to show you how a platform like OGP can, can possibly help. So before I do that, um, just to give you some background on OGP, who's heard of OGP? Just, uh, okay, all right, so that's quite a few in the room. Um, so just some brief background. Um, we are 79 members. Our newest country member is uh, the Seychelles. I actually have some colleagues doing a kickoff workshop in the Seychelles this week, so uh, Paris is lovely, but <laughs> <laughs> um, we're also working with local governments as well. So we have local members, 20 of them, um, and they range very much in terms of what they look like. So we're working with big cities like Seoul, Paris, Buenos Aires, um, but also places like uh, a regency in Indonesia called Bojanagoro, a county in Kenya called El Goyo Maraquet, um, also Ontario in Canada and Scotland. So we're working with a very diverse range of, of local governments. And part of the OGP partnership is, of course, the thousands of civil society organizations that we're working with. Um, we're also working with multilateral organizations and uh, other international NGOs as well. Um, and when a government joins OGP, they commit to three things. The first is a real constructive dialogue between government, civil society, citizens, and other actors to define public problems, um, which can be addressed through open government approaches. 
Secondly, um, they're committing to a two-year action plan, which contains concrete commitments that address those public problems. And thirdly, they commit to an independent monitoring and assessment process. So we're looking at uh, not only the progress on those commitments made in the action plan, but also the quality and depth of engagement between government and civil society. Um, before I give you the um, specific examples of civic tech projects that have been scaled via OGP, I want to briefly talk about Open Gov Week. So this took place last week, and I think this is a really cool example of how one OGP commitment in a country action plan uh, was scaled into a global uh, event. So back in 2017, the government of Italy uh, held an open administration week where they invited uh, their stakeholders, be it students, uh, public administration bodies, uh, civil society organizations, to develop their own events or activities under the banner of open government. And it was really that idea of let's let a thousand flowers bloom. And the Italian government uh, encouraged us to take this global. Um, so we've done this the last two years. Um, and last week, we had over 500 events across 55 different countries, uh, within some non-OGP members as well. Um, so that was really cool to see. And this is from Colombia. We have the Netherlands. This is Indonesia. This is Canada. This is Paraguay. And this is Secondi Takaradi, which is a pair of twin cities in Ghana. They're part of our local program. Um, and a number of the activities that took place as part of Open Gov Week were civic tech related initiatives. So there was hackathons in France and Canada. There was some open data workshops in Argentina. Um, there was also um, uh, people were rolling out tech for anti-corruption monitoring in Ukraine. So even though this broad initiative is not technically civic tech related, it's very much part and parcel of a number of the events that took place. Okay, um, I'm gonna jump into the three examples. Um, this is an image from um, the anti-austerity protests in Madrid um, that erupted uh, in the wake of the financial crisis starting in 2011. Um, there was one particular protester, his name was Pablo Soto, maybe some of you know him. Uh, he was a skilled uh, engineer and he worked amongst a smaller group um, to help try and organize the protesters. Um, it started off small and manageable, but they realized they needed some way to communicate, develop their tactics, um, uh, develop ideas, vote on those ideas. So they built a, a platform to do this. And then in 2015, uh, Pablo Soto, he was representing the Aloha Madrid uh, political party, and he was elected as a councilman to Madrid City Council. And he took that software into the council, and they rolled it out as a platform for Madrid um, called Decide Madrid. Um, and this platform um, provides the opportunity for uh, uh, voting on participatory budgeting, um, Citizens can make um, proposals for how the city should be run, and you can vote on those proposals. There's public debates. So this is a really holistic public participation platform that is used now in Madrid. And what is interesting is in 2016, Madrid joined OGP as part of the local program. And within their first action plan, they committed to scaling this uh, this platform beyond Madrid City Council. Um, and they did that. Uh, and now over 100 cities and also nas some national governments are using this, this software. This is the underlying software, it's called Consul. And it's, actually, it's really exciting to see how this grew from one city to over 100. And it's really built out a large community around the software and they actually have conferences and they meet to discuss how they're using this public participation tool. And I think there was three important things for the scaling of this. Um, one was the fact that they always knew that they wanted to scale. So they built in um, some important factors to begin with. Of course, it's open source, it was free. And they also set up a small international team who was going to be doing the outreach and the liaison. The console team also told me it was really important being part of the OGP network, and that really helped them um, create that intergovernmental communication that was necessary for them to make the right contacts to set this up in other cities around the world. Um, and we also have the console uh, platform being used specifically for OGP processes as well, but also much broader processes. And the third thing that was important was the fact that OGP helped to deepen the dialogue between government and citizens. And that was absolutely key for making a platform like this successful, to have the citizen demand and the interest to actually engage and use it. Okay, my next example comes from Kaduna State in Nigeria, which is also part of our local program. Um, in Kaduna, there was a recognition um, 
from government and civil society and citizens that infrastructure projects were not being implemented properly, um, that money was going missing and things weren't getting done on time and get done properly. Um, so the state um, decided to start monitoring these projects. Originally, it started enlisting the civil servants working for the government to go and start looking at these projects to see if what was being um, what was supposed to be spent was actually being spent and actually happening. But they realized they didn't have enough people, so they crowdsourced citizens to do this for them. Um, so this launched the Eyes and Ears project, um, which um, engages citizens to report on the infrastructure projects via an app, via a hotline, um, also social media and text messaging. So it's really a citizen engagement crowdsourced project. Um, so this was actually launched before Kaduna joined OGP. But with the first action plan of Kaduna in 2018, they committed to strengthening the broader citizen engagement ecosystem around this Eyes and Ears project. Um, and they did this by um, developing um, new kind of offline techniques, including town halls, a radio show, trainings, and really focusing on inclusion as well. So ensuring that minorities and vulnerable groups are also being pulled into this broader ecosystem. Uh, my final example comes from back to Italy. Um, in Italy, um, uh, Italy is a recipient of EU, co EU cohesion funds. And without wanting to sound too Trumpian, but it's literally billions and billions of euros we're talking about when we're talking about these funds. And this brings with it um, a risk, obviously, of corruption, but it's also um, you know, waste and general mismanagement. Um, but also there was a feeling in Italy that people didn't realize, didn't know what, what was being spent on, on these projects and why these projects were chosen. Um, and also, um, you know, what were the outcomes of these projects? So in 2012, they, the government launched this platform called Open Coesione, where they um, uh, put open data about every single project that is being funded by the cohesion funds. So that ranges from huge infrastructure projects like highways um, down to individual student grants. So it was really the entire spectrum of, of funding. Um, but what was interesting, they really focused on the reuse of this data. Um, and they built a couple of spin-off projects. The first is called Monithon. Um, this is, a, as you can see, a combination of monitoring and marathon. Um, and this basically encourages the public to pick an interesting project from the Open Coesione platform and to go and self-organize and to check whether that, how that uh, money is being spent and whether that project is being delivered. And then um, they should deliver a report to the platform. The other spin-off project, which um, this is a really cool project, this is the Open Coesione School, um, which takes that Monithon um, model but it's built it out into a broader civic, uh, civic uh, educational program, which includes um, things like you know, learning about public policy, developing digital skills, how to use open data, data journalism, um, also things like yeah, they actually go and conduct interviews with people working on the projects and meeting with local policymakers. Um, so, this, so as I mentioned, Open Coesione was launched in 2012, and that was at the same time Italy joined OGP. And the first OGP action plan had some um, commitments which supported parts of this, this broader project. Um, and when I spoke to the Open Coesione team, they said it was, again, really important to be part of the OGP network. And what was important was that um, they were already pretty well connected within the EU, given this is a sort of an EU project, and they were linked to governments working with the same kind of funding. But they managed to make connections way beyond the EU. So they cited a specific example where they met someone from the Philippines who was able to help them work through a specific challenge or problem. Um, so that was one thing that was important. Another thing that was important was um, um, the fact that in Italy there have been numerous administrations since the, uh, since the launch of this. It Italian politics is quite dynamic, let's say. Um, so having Open Coesione connected to an international initiative and within a, in, a, in the OGP action plan helped them with the continuity uh, across administrations and got more buy-in from the rest of government and sort of had that support that was necessary to keep the project um, you know, secure. Um, and what's interesting also is the, um, the current Italian action plan is under development at the moment. 
Um, and they are talking about possibly inserting open cozy only school into that platform to scale it much in the same way that Madrid scaled um, the CD Madrid Beyond Borders. So that's something under discussion at the moment. Okay, um, I want to summarize. Oh, sorry, that's an image of the, um, the monitoring from Monithon. I want to summarize these three examples with a few observations about how OGP might be able to help civic tech projects. Um, so one, as I mentioned, this, this international connection. So OGP is a huge global network um, of thousands of reformers. And I think having the very specific connections between governments um, have, can be very helpful for some projects. In others, it's a more general um, being part of that community. We can help make the connections to overcome challenges. That's a big part of the work that I personally do and a number of my colleagues is trying to identify those opportunities to make connections and to support projects across borders. Um, second thing I think is important is the government civil society cooperation. Um, I heard in the presentation this morning from Rebecca, like we're at the stage now, the civic tech community is at the stage now, where it's really important to be working with institutions in a very constructive way and not just to be shouting at them. The OGP model is designed exactly for this. It is designed to build trust, to build cooperation and relationships between government and civil society. So if that's something your project needs, OGP can maybe help deliver on that. A third um, thing which I mentioned in the Italian example is securing government buy-in. <coughs> in many countries, um, action plans are signed off at cabinet level, and we always have a ministerial contact who is responsible for OGP. At city level, that's usually a mayor. Um, so obviously that commitment is different from one country to the next, but broadly speaking, it can help secure that political support and intergovernmental attention for a particular project. Fourthly, um, OGP offers a really strong framework for implementation and accountability. OGP action plans last for two years, and we monitor those. So if a government says they're going to build a platform or a portal or something by the end of 2019, we're going to check that, and we're going to write a report about whether that happened and deliver that to the government, and then they should respond to that, and you could go around knocking on doors. So there is a very strong implementation accountability uh, component. And then the final thing, which didn't come up in these examples, but I think worth mentioning, um, in many countries, um, um, donors, bilateral aid agencies, um, multilateral institutions are involved with OGP and are supporting um, action plans um, and the implementation of specific commitments. So putting something in an OGP action plan can help get um, financial support and bring that attention of donors. And something that some of you may have listened to earlier this morning um, about the OGP Trust Fund. This is a World Bank hosted uh, fund, which is our first effort at providing direct funding for the um, four parts of the OGP process. And that in could include the implementation of specific commitments. So that could include projects that were in an OGP action plan. Um, I want to finalize the presentation by um, talking about what we could do better to work with the civic tech community and to support these kind of, this kind of work. Firstly, I think you might notice that some of these, well, all of these apart from Madrid, which is something of a hybrid, are quite government-initiated and government-driven projects. We do have some really exciting citizen-driven, citizen-initiated projects within OGP, but I would like to see more, frankly, um, and so that's one thing. Secondly, I think just generally working with, integrating, talking with the civic tech community. Um, so this is obviously being present here today is one important step, but I think we should be doing more of that. Um, thirdly, I think we can work with other organizations who are focused specifically on scaling projects. Um, so for example, those who are funding, I'm, I'm living in Berlin, I've recently um, learned about the Prototype Fund, which is a fund hosted by the Open Knowledge Foundation, and they work um, to identify new projects, new apps, and give uh, one-off funding to um, citizens to develop their ideas. And I think it would be interesting to work with them to, for example, see whether there are projects that could be solved with open government approaches and whether that could be integrated in the OGP process, for example. And the final point, I think, um, we could learn a lot from the approaches of the civic tech community. I think the methods of user testing, prototyping are really interesting. And 
given that OGP action plans are government-owned approved documents, they can sometimes be a bit risk-averse. And I think I would like to see a bit more experimentation within OGP uh, action plans. And I think there's, there's smart ways to do that and to be flexible and just to build in that kind of, you know, a little bit more experimentation. So that's, that's everything I have. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Brendan Oltan. Uh, I have uh, at least one hat that is uh, as, a, as an Irishman, another one as a, uh, as a music teacher. Um, but uh, weirdly, at the moment, I, I have one as a, uh, as a civil servant of the United Kingdom, uh, where I work in the cabinet office, um, which I have to say is a really good vantage point uh, if you care about trying to change the relationship between citizens and the state. Um, as I do, and that is something that I think overlaps quite well with a lot of CivTech organizations. Um, one of the things I got to do there was to be the, the technical architect of data.gov.uk, which is one of our open government partnership commitments in the United Kingdom uh, to make data open, but the thing that I'm doing at the moment uh, is, uh, is acting as the tech lead for uh, an innovation fund called GovTech Catalyst. So that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, what we've been trying to do uh, is to try to solve a tiny bit of this problem um, that government tends to have when it is very good at investing in um, innovation, R&D, early basic research on one side, um, and then when it actually comes to buying things and scaling and making it go you know, bigger than that, suddenly all the money has gone away and it isn't the same people thinking about it and it's not really something you can put into the world. And that happens over and over and over again in the public sector. Um, so we were trying to think of a way that we would do um, a sort of innovation fund but focus on scaling out from the beginning, make that the kind of the main thing that we were thinking about doing. Um, so this is uh, a little bit of our lessons learned from the first, uh, first year of trying to actually do that. Um, we, we did peel off some money for it um, out of, uh, you know, out of the uh, billion pound, you know, government investment in artificial intelligence in the UK. We managed to, you know, peel off 20 million over three years, which in government terms, um, six million a year to try to improve uh, services for, you know, 65 million odd people is actually not a huge amount, but it's enough that we can do a lot of experimenting and look at scale quite quickly. And so the way that we actually decided to do that uh, was to focus a lot on that idea of partnership, uh, as, as was just mentioned, this idea that what we're going to be doing is connecting to tech companies, um, connecting to civic society organizations, and specifically thinking about some of the civ techy sort of things uh, that might help government to do its job better in delivering services, and as an incidental effect of that, um, or as a deliberate effect, uh, create the sort of data and transparency that would allow more of those initiatives to go forward. So, we created some, uh, some public challenges, and, and this was, we thought about, I, I think our funders at the, at, the, at the Ministry of Business would probably have been happy for this to be a sort of, you know, go buy a bunch of robots fund, and then go buy a bunch of artificial intelligence fund, and then go buy a bunch of internets of whatever things. But we thought that that sort of technology-led question, as, um, uh, as Mark mentioned, first thing today, like, it, it kind of begs the question, what's that actual question if the, an if the answer is you know, artificial intelligence? Um, so we crowdsourced um, what we were going to actually be working on. Um, we just kind of asked for ideas of public sector challenges. And for each one, uh, we decided to ask them uh, how well they understood what their users actually needed to do, like the person who actually needs to interact with the service, um, how well the public body understood what had been done in the space, so how well could they learn from what had come before, and how much time and money and expertise and data and access to facilities and access to users uh, can the public body actually put into this. Um, so sure, we're happy to put in some of, some of the money to do some of the work, but that's kind of, uh, kind of secretly about uh, trying to get buy-in from public bodies to experiment. So we picked 15 things. I, I think a lot of them are very um, uh, civ techy, uh, and then I'll say what we did to try to figure out how to, how to structure this thing. Um, so we did, you know, three, three rounds of five. We've picked 15 now. We're totally busy for the next two years. Um, I've highlighted a couple that seem particularly civic, uh, civ techy. Um, finding, you know, looking for 
uh, terrorist propaganda online, is it's difficult to find a single user for that, but certainly trying to support a circular economy and understanding uh, how waste works uh, is actually a very, uh, a very uh, civic problem, uh, as is dealing with loneliness and rural isolation, as is dealing with uh, traffic congestion, uh, as is helping local councils to support the people in their areas, especially uh, more uh, uh, rural ones without a lot of urban areas, uh, very tricky. Um, improving firefighter safety doesn't, isn't necessarily the thing that matters to you until your house is actually the one that's, that's burning. Um, but making better use of data for public sector audits um, is something where I would really hope to see a lot of both of the um, kind of both the resistance and the rebuilding and both kind of the uh, activism and um, the solidarity uh, around holding government to account about whether we're spending money well and generating the data that lets people determine that. Um, we thought that we would look at um, a little bit more about trying to find things that we don't want at our borders, not that that would in any way be you know, a pressing issue for the UK. Um, we did want to uh, then look at our laws themselves. Uh, can we find better overlaps between uh, regulations that apply to a business? You know, what is actually in effect right now? What do you need to send data to? Um, how, do you, how do you get better prescriptions when you move between different care environments that the government provides? And so we, we kind of found, we, we found 15, we funded them, but we didn't know um, exactly what we were going to do uh, in terms of trying to address the barriers. Like this, this essential problem of scale uh, was the one that was still kind of eluding us. So um, being the government digital service, you, if you know us, you probably have a sense that uh, we're very big on kind of human-centered design in general, uh, and so we did some research. Um, we wanted to try to figure out really framing the question in terms of like what's, what's the problem here? Why is it hard for people to work with government? Why is it hard for projects to scale? Why is it hard to bring things from a sort of pilot idea into something that, that might um, make, case, make, uh, make sense across an entire sector and, and would be financial and, and every other policy way sustainable over a long period of time? It was all very confusing. Uh, it was all very unclear. Our funders at um, Her Majesty's Tre Treasury, at the Ministry of Business, at Department for uh, Digital Culture, Media, and Sport. Um, these people all had different ideas of what this might be. Um, so we figured we would have to try to unpack that a little bit. Um, our own team, you know, we had, you know, we had the business case from the original 20 million pounds, but that, and we could break that down into some questions. Um, but we, after we had kind of framed that, we did what we usually do, which is to go try to understand uh, what are some goals of an actual discovery project and go out and talk to some actual people. Uh, which is how we do. So this is, uh, we were trying to find places where the answer couldn't be found uh, just by kind of reading documents, but instead, you know, actually doing some interviews and talking to people. Um, so we tried to mix, uh, we talked to a mix of people in public bodies trying to do interesting work, trying to move on the quality of their services, use technology well and effectively, create good data and use it. Uh, and we talked to about half were, um, uh, organizations who had an understanding of technology um, and had an understanding of data but found it probably difficult uh, to, to work with government. So, mo so our, our, research, our researchees, our, our user selectees, these were very, um, tried to be evenly balanced. Of course, it resulted, as it always does, in quite a bit of individual bits of information, which we tried to, you know, uh, lump and sort and put together. This was the first chance of one of our uh, Department for Digital Culture, Media, and Sport uh, being involved with uh, the kind of pointy end of user research. So we got to baptize a few civil servants as well um, in, the, uh, in the ways of post-its. And what did we learn? Learned a few things. Um, so I probably don't need to tell you in any sort of surprising way that the culture of government um, is, is very tricky. Um, working with smaller organizations is, is perceived as being quite risky. Um, startups and smaller firms, especially when they're doing various projects, don't always have the, uh, the capital and the time, the runway, uh, to actually wait out working with government. And so people say that, you know, government might, you know, do all this innovation stuff over here. We've got city labs and catapults and university transfers and R&D funds and uh, fellowships, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but then that's nothing like the process that you actually go to if you're trying to have government invest in your project over a long period of time. So we needed to do a little bit about that. And even the people who were the best at this, because in most cases, the civic organizations we wanted to work with and the tech companies we wanted to work with were way better at digital, way better at data, way better at human-centered design than the public bodies actually were. Um, but they found it really hard to get uh, access to uh, the data that they actually needed to, to do a good job. I'm sure this doesn't 
again, sound like a surprise, and I'm sorry to say obvious things to, to a room full of experts, um, but I think this surprised some of our government stakeholders as well, that this was actually a barrier to keeping um, smaller, smaller enterprises and civic organizations from working with government. They could not compete with incumbents because incumbents had the database. Um, and that's something that, that we saw a lot. And even when there wasn't a database that was wrapped up in an incumbent, um, we found that a lot of the, um, the, lot of the data that you would have needed to work w uh, with was locked up in other proprietary formats on desktops, on servers, places where you couldn't get access to. And so you really couldn't scale that. Um, you couldn't really move out of the pilot, out of the pilot phase. And that scalability is important because while we like doing pilots, government has to operate at scale. The stuff we have to make has to be for everyone. Uh, really has to work for tens of millions of people at least. Um, and, the, and this problem of scalability and knowing that you're working towards tens of millions of users, including the most difficult to reach users and, and the ones with the lowest digital skills and everything else about the difficulty of a universal service, um, that actually creates another barrier uh, towards being able to do interesting kinds of innovation um, along with government. Because you, if you know that that's what you're going for, um, and if, you, if the public body kind of sets up that partnership in such a way that they're saying, oh yes, well, we'll experiment, and then you know, next year, tens of millions of people, um, that's actually gonna be a big capacity problem for a lot of uh, organizations who we otherwise would want to work with. And so even if you have the resources to, to show that an idea can work, it's very difficult to take that um, and so, again, gives more, uh, uh, gives more of a, uh, an advantage to bigger companies uh, with bigger teams, with more money, with more runways, uh, who can actually promise uh, to be able to scale to tens of millions of people, even if they you know, don't even really know what the product or service is going to be yet. Um, Working with government is an advantage. The actual sort of badge of working with government was, was, was something that a lot of people found very strong. Um, it was, oddly enough, seen as being deploying something in actual partnership with a local authority or an arms like body or an executive agency or a regulator or a rulemaker, actually deploying something, uh, it was assumed that whatever you had done uh, must be much better tested and very rigorous. Um, anyone who has seen and worked with government technology probably knows this isn't always the case, but it is something that uh, at least is the perception. So, it, And so there are some advantages to actually working with government um, that actually help, uh, actually help organizations to, to move on. Um, government doesn't really want to be an early adopter in many cases um, because of a somewhat natural conservatism of being able to, uh, in, in the sense of needing to know that something will work, not being able to afford a lot of expensive failures at scale, uh, but also um, more, uh, more prosaic concerns like numbers of you know, browsers you support and types of mobiles and ability to support in call centers and all sorts of things. Um, it's tricky to jump into the, into the newer things. And so the newer bits are perceived as being more risky. That makes it harder to come into government with an idea of partnership that depends on something that's kind of on the leading edge of uh, how that technology might be, uh, might be developed. So uh, government, I'm not gonna talk about blockchain and government, it's its, its own thing, but um, if, if for some reason government did decide um, that this was a really important thing that we needed to know a lot about right now, it would be very, it'd be very difficult to do um, because, it, because it's tricky. Um, the regulations are hard. Um, in some ways, government actually has quite a bit of flexibility in, in buying things. We can do research projects, we can do innovation partnerships, we can do lots of ways of things that are not just you know, typical contracts you know, that are all written down with you know, 50 pages of requirements at the beginning. There, there's nothing in the regs that says that you have to over-specify your projects. It's in the culture, though, that gets built on top of the regulations that people say, ah, yes, we must over-specify our projects because that way it won't be our fault if something goes wrong. Um, this obviously is, is, a, is a giant problem when you're trying to do something for the first time. Um, and I would say that um, lots of people think that there are lots of more regulatory problems than there actually are with government doing something different. Um, people think that you know, state aid rules are, are really, really difficult, that that's the limitation. Um, but in many cases, uh, departments don't really understand that at all. Um, it's not actually all that bad. Um, and the procurement process, of course, is seen as being risky if it's new, uh, with the result that tech companies tend to avoid government altogether. Um, but this. This means that instead of avoiding government, it means that, again, the bigger players end up being the ones who kind of come forward to meet the needs, which means that those bigger players are the ones who are able to build strong relationships, um, 
which means that government then has a bias towards working to people they already kind of know personally, and then companies without those relationships and organizations and societies have a hard time building them. Um, it just kind of creates a sort of vicious cycle from that. Um, knowing that you win tenders based on the personal relationship rather than an understanding of what you're trying to get done uh, can be kind of a problem. Which really brings to the, the last area of, of risk, which is what this really is all about. Um, citizen critical areas are tricky to innovate around. They are tricky to do new things um, because the financial risk um, and also they tend to be the really sensitive policy areas. Like these are almost the last thing that governments want to experiment with when they're trying to improve a policy or service um, because it feels like the hardest bit and the bit where if it doesn't work exactly as you think it's going to work, uh, you'll be in the most trouble. And one thing that governments generally around the world say is that they really don't want to be in trouble um, or at least perceived to be uh, spending money badly. And indeed, we should not spend money badly. We should be good at what we do, um, but also, crucially, need to understand how to balance these different kinds of risks together. So we have a hard time with uh, public bodies not really, because they can't see the whole thing of what it looks like five years from now, not wanting to start with it and not wanting to start with it because it seems difficult. So what have we done with this? We've designed our, at least the, this tiny experiment that we're doing from, from cabinet office is about continuing to try and continuing to make a couple of structural changes that we think will address some of these aspects of risk. So the, the process that we've tried to start with, um, first, instead of starting from the sort of technology and then working back to who in government might need this particular kind of robot, um, instead crowdsourcing the actual policy challenges and then selecting those based on the ability of that kind of public sector team to be able to support um, a real design process. Um, that I think is something that we um, are finding is very difficult to build up that skill, uh, but is also re resulting in challenges that we think have a pretty good chance of actually getting out there into the world because the team's behind them. Um, and even after we go through the whole kind of mechanical bits of, you know, putting stuff out to a challenge and evaluate and all that, which, by the way, is still, still um, less time than government often spends to, 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 to do things. Um, we're kind of forcing a certain understanding of risk by funding five organizations simultaneously to try showing the feasibility of whatever it is you're trying to solve, um, knowing that you're not going to end up turning all five of them into something that you do for years and years, but just simply to say, we're going to look at the program space. So we've been funding uh, in our program, you know, five companies simultaneously, uh, giving them, you know, 50K, 10 week uh, development pr program, uh, just to show the basic feasibility of, of their approach of what they want to try, of the way in which the, the platform or the, or the, or the, uh, the, the civic network or the, or the activism platform is going, to, is going to work before we kind of go into saying, this is something we could do a, a sort of private beta. But even there, we, after doing those show and tells to see all of these different groups, we keep going with another, um, with another, uh, you know, half, half a million to each of two companies to actually spend 10 months really building out the product with actual users, with actual data, um, building things in, you know, very much in partnership and co-designing with the public body. Um, again, as a way to try to make sure that we keep that diversity of thought, um, to make sure that the different ideas are still, are still being considered. Um, and then with what should be a better mix between the approach uh, and the need of the actual policymaker, um, we're trying to make sure that well before we get to the end of that second phase, uh, that we actually focus on the mechanics of making it possible for government to continue to invest in this platform or technology or team um, by helping teams to get onto frameworks uh, for purchasing, by helping them to you know, uh, establish a, a commercial route to market by helping them find, you know, subcontractors or other relationships that will, that will help them meet this, the, uh, the needs of scale that the public sector knows that it will need, you know, kind of a year from now. And so we try to make it so that the actual mechanics of being able to not only sign a contract with your one lead customer at the end of this one innovation challenge, yes, that should be doable, but also it should be something that is almost immediately can be bought by any public body, at least in the UK. Um, any public body can invest in it and start to getting and start getting some of the advantages of, of that approach. So I, I know it seems very technical and procurement based, but the results of our research kind of suggested to us that it was actually a lot of those bits that we needed to, to kind of fix more than to try to just kind of come up with better ideas because everyone has really, really good ideas. There's lots and lots of good ideas out there. Um, and they can really succeed very well. So this is our, you know, very, very small team, and, and we are somewhat um, regretting commissioning, you know, 75 simultaneous projects right at the moment. Um, 
But we are definitely learning a lot uh, by doing that and thinking especially about, uh, and that forces us to focus on our own kind of multiplier effect, which is to help public bodies get better at doing uh, the sort of user-centered projects um, that will in the long run be you know, quite, quite virtuous for, for everyone involved. Um, so you know, please, please do take a look. We, we would like to learn very much from what you're trying to do and what you're experimenting with uh, and would be very happy to, to get in touch uh, at any point. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, definitely uh, appreciate your time and attention. Cheers. Thanks very much, Lucia, Helen, and Brendan. Do we have any questions? We've got plenty of time for questions, so let's start. And if you could just stand and... Uh, say your name and your organization or affiliation, that would be great. Yeah, so I'm Eric Reese from Johns Hopkins University in the US. And my main question is for Lucia. So when you're thinking about the kind of gender work and perspective that you're doing, I'm just curious about how you start uh, and how you and your organization started doing that from a very tactical perspective. Like, what did you do with the folks in your organization and the folks you were working with? Thank you. Um, I would try to answer. Uh, as I was saying, I, I work in an uh, international foundation and I lead an uh, international alliance that's called Altec. And Altec spent like five years working with civic tech organizations in Latin America. And one of the main problems in civic tech projects and organizations and platforms in, in the region is the lack of engagement. For example, we have very success, successful project, but at the end, they have like thousands of participants. Of in, in, on the other hand, for example, you have like a, a very good moment at the beginning of the use of the platform, and after that, the, the use of the platform uh, go down a lot a lot, and when you start to analyze, analyze, an, analyze, uh, analyze sorry, uh, the use of the platform and the different people involved, you realize that the, the type of participation is more or less the same. We are talking always about the same type of population uh, related to the use. So we started to work with the organization and trying to know and understand what type, how they develop the, the workshop, how they develop the, the campaigns, how they try to engage with government, how they develop the commitment of OGP uh, in the different countries. And thinking about that, the, we, we take a lot of information about that. So we develop an action plan an action plan for 30 organizations in Latin America. So we work with them for a year, trying to improve the way they develop technology, the way they started to think in workshops, the, 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 the way they develop campaigns, uh, trying to include a gender perspective and, yeah, and a more inclusive way to, to engage people in general. So yes, at the end we have these meetings, uh, but also we have like a very specific cases of, of improvement in, I don't know, like seven countries. Thank you. Okay, that's a big exercise. Many thanks um, to the panel. I would like to start by asking um, Lucia, um, about a point you made around diversity, which I think is very important, and inclusion. And to further ask how you address the challenge of diversity within diversity. So, for instance, we're talking about citizens, very important, but not a homogeneous category. Younger women, older women, women with disabilities, elderly women, we tend to forget that, you know, they, they are part of community. I just want to understand better um, how you, you, you might respond to that, or how you're responding to that in your project. Um, Helen, thank you for that example about Kaduna. I just want to understand a bit better 
because I live there in Nigeria and you know, I've got some shared affinities with Kaduna State. And one of the lessons we're learning is that change will happen where you have change champions. People in power, in government, who want to do things a bit differently and, and they want to build systems. Um, what are the lessons you're taking away from Kaduna State that you think we could you know, scale up or replicate um, somewhere else? And thank you, Brendan, also for your intervention. Um, this is not to put you on the spot. This is just a very honest question I want to ask because you mentioned the fact that sometimes maybe SMEs uh, might not be able to get a, a book, big push in the door as much as the big multinational corporations. And interestingly, what got my attention was the last slide where you had a very hardworking team and the, the gentleman who had a post-it on his forehead showing how hard you work, and I respect that. But it just occurred to me to ask, maybe your team might not also need to be a bit more diverse to, to replicate the diversity of the United Kingdom? Because sometimes it's about trust. Trust is also a function of who is talking to me and how I perceive their relationship to me. And so if we have a bit more diversity reflected in the team, might we be able to get more trust going? Thank you. First, thank you for the question. It's something that we are working on a lot, and perhaps I don't have like a complete answer. Um, Avina is a quite diverse organization. We work from the Amazonia to Mexico City, so the contexts are quite different, and always I receive questions related to that. Um, we try to develop some lines of works um, in order to be able not only to think in the gap between men and women, but also to think and to be more close to different environments. For example, we, we have a, a, a line of work related to civic tech in water, in water and other, for example, in biomas that we call in, in Latin America is El Chaco Americano and La Amazonia. Uh, that allow us to understand better and to develop civic technology thinking in a specific context and also in a very close alliance with the organization that had been working for many, 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 many years in this specific, in this specific context. For example, uh, in, in the Amazonia, in, in Brazil, you have organizations that had been working for 30, 40 years and developing knowledge uh, about the, 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 for example, the forest on how to oversee uh, the la tala de arboles. I don't know how to say it and, and things like that. So we work in very in a very very close relation with this type of organization and trying to engage with the yes with all the sector that work with them. Um, just about Kaduna, I'm sure you know far more about this project if you <laughs> actually live there. Um, but I think the key lesson that I wanted to extract from the example was that uh, a project like Eyes and Ears, um, the sustainability and success of that uh, depends on the broader ecosystem of participation. And I think that's really important when you have an exciting new project where citizens are asked to participate. How do you keep that enthusiasm going? How do you ensure the sustainability of such a project so they don't just report once and then say, oh, that's my job done, but they're motivated to continue. And I think that's why um, within the OGP Action Plan, it was interesting to see how they wanted to build out that ecosystem with online and offline techniques. Um, and I think once you have that and you're working on that, then you can also develop new projects on top. Of, um, and the issue you mentioned of champions, I mean, in every single OGP member, this is absolutely key. Um, when we have political champions or champions within civil society, um, they can really help drive and you know, push, push something forward. Um, so that's absolutely key. And I think once, if we have champions in each sector that we're working with, that's the ideal situation, but you know, that doesn't always happen. So identifying them, cultivating, nurturing champions, providing them the space and connecting them also with other champions in other countries is also really important. Just, I'll just pick up the, the SME point quickly. Um, the, uh, 
I think what we're finding is that if we, if we set small enough things to start with and then build from that rather than starting with the whole amount, um, we can actually set levels where the big, the really big companies aren't interested in working with us because the small amounts at the beginning seem like they're not worth them doing the, you know, a proposal. Um, whereas, in fact, it does work fairly well uh, for SMEs. So while we don't have a, um, in what we're trying to experiment with now, we don't have a, a cutoff for organizations of a particular size. Um, but 90% of the organizations we've been signing contracts with have been uh, micro or, or SMEs uh, in, in Britain, and, and the larger companies just haven't really been uh, haven't been interested. Um, I definitely take the point uh, in terms of diversity of, of our own team. Um, in our organization and the directorate we, we work in, our you know, our, our, our diversity is a bit better than the tech sector in general uh, for both um, gender and ethnicity and other balance. Um, about the same as the UK as a whole, but it's still uh, still nowhere close to where it to where it needs to be. And I think that's a, a, a constant a constant area of effort and something that we need to we need to do very well on. Um, we've made a, a, a conscious effort. I think we've done some by by doing things like having diverse hiring panels and you know requiring and reaching out to. Uh, other sorts of communities to, to find people. Um, we've increased uh, the representation within our various teams quite a bit. We found that actually it takes some work, but very much pays off in the diversity of thought um, around the table. But uh, as always, it, it's something to, to keep working on for a long time. Thank you. Um, just a question for Brendan. The um, I mean, the process is really impressive, but I guess it also builds on the fact that in the UK there's been a lot of experimentation with kind of digital services and designing them and procuring them for a number of years. And some of us are in sort of contexts where it's like, you know, it's still like 15 years ago, you've got a monolithic IT department that signs a big contract with SAP and everything breaks three years later. Um, so where would you suggest somebody start? Because this is like the end point of a number of years. If, 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 if a um, local government or national government wanted to get better at this kind of procurement, what would be a place that they would start that if they didn't have all of those years of experience? And the second thing was just one question on the bigger and smaller. I mean, one of the things that big companies do do is um, sometimes register branches that look very small. Um, there was a story recently about AWS getting SME support from the UK government because it looked like a small company. How do you kind of filter that kind of gamesmanship out? Um, so the, 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 the question of, of where to start, I think, um, if, if you know what you're going for, if you have a sense of a standard, uh, either that you've kind of created yourself or, or have a way um, to adapt, um, that seems, at least for the digital service, has been the starting point, is to say, this is what we think good looks like. And then we just look for every possible opportunity to apply that. Um, for organizations with a lot of legacy IT, um, the places to do that are usually when contracts are ending. And when you know that they're going to end a year from now, that's the time to kind of say, well, we could just renew this contract with the supplier, or we could actually look at whether what's being proposed fits these new principles that we think are important, and that may level the playing field enough. Um, it, it still takes time. It has taken many, many years in the UK government. We're very, very far away from, from having solved that. It's just, you know, you need to have people. I think I would say that the actual spend control and assessment kind of assurance power um, in government to say what good looks like instead of just kind of being an innovation lab in the corner, um, that's actually what's allowed us to make whatever progress we have, even though we have so many miles yet to go. Um, and the question on, on gaming the system, I mean, sure, yeah, lots of people can you know, uh, use, use Microsoft as a subcontractor and yet that's, you know, uh, be, be, be fronted by, you know, a company of two people. Um, that, that does happen. We try to, I guess, I just try to set up the structure, I suppose, the landscape such that we get the kind of people that we want to work with. Um, and if really big companies want to create approaches within this idea of iterative user-driven development and if they're willing to not come in talking about a lot of proprietary uh, both software and data standards that we can't support and don't fit our standards, like if they're actually willing to change what they do, um, yeah, we're happy to, uh, happy to work with them. Uh, not in the sense that we want to get re-locked into a new set of standards, but just that um, uh, if someone's willing to actually make a significant progress towards being more open in both their code and their data, um, sure, they should definitely work with the public sector. Um, it doesn't mean we will go to them only, if that makes sense. We have time for a, a couple more, so. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. 
Um, so I had a question for Helen and one for Brendan. So for Helen, you talked about the thousand flowers idea, and I think that's a really good approach, and it's kind of underused because people want to avoid duplicating work when quite often it's valuable. But how do you prune perhaps like unsavory flowers or ideas that might not fit either like your ethical standards or the other standards? And then for Brendan, where civic tech is quite often not for profit, how do you encourage kind of local government and central government to integrate not-for-profit, so free civic tech, so rather than procurement, just get them to use stuff that's all free to improve service delivery? It's a very interesting question, pruning, pruning our flowers. <laughs> I mean, the whole premise of OGP is this, you know, um, let the thousand flowers bloom, homegrown. Um, OGP is a voluntary mechanism, and within a country, um, how the OGP process looks like and what goes in an action plan is driven by the actors in country, and I think that's really really the beauty of OGP. Um, we, we do have some mechanisms and um, channels for dealing with, um, I would say, countries or governments that are acting contrary to what we call OGP values. Um, so, um, for example, civic space is always top of mind for OGP. Um, without the space for dialogue and action, um, the, the process itself doesn't work. So we do have uh, a mechanism um, whereby, for example, civil society organizations or other actors can file official um, complaints to the OGP support unit um, if, for example, um, there is a serious case of squeezing civic space, and for example, that's in process with Azerbaijan at the moment. So we do have um, some um, yeah, mechanisms in place, but as, as I said, it is a voluntary mechanism. Um, we can't go around and check on every tiny little interaction. Of course, we're not policing anything, but I think this um, response, it's called the response policy we have at OGP. I think this is the, really the key way for addressing like, those major kind of concerns that might crop up within OGP. Uh, and I suppose a, a point on the nonprofits to your question. Of course, government you know behaves as a as a nonprofit, and in many ways would rather work with uh, with with nonprofits. Um, the there's something if you're working with government though there's something nice about a contract even if it doesn't involve money because it kind of establishes who's responsible and, and sets an expectation for how you're going to be working together into the future. Um, if if you need a public body to invest in to continue to support your platform, whether they actually do work or someone else does work, you probably need to know about what its sustainability picture looks like into the future, um, how it's going to be maintained and patched and continue to be made secure, um, but also how you're going to um, continue to learn more about the problem space and how to, how to adapt it over time. Um, in many cases, when the value is accruing to the citizen, um, you have a kind of a, a very classic public good problem where it actually is in the interest of the, the state or the local authority to uh, invest in keeping certain platforms going, um, even, if it, even if that's just to support the sustainability of, of a nonprofit. Um, most public services absolutely need to be free at the point of delivery to citizens, um, but because all services need to continue to be maintained and, uh, and, and patched over time uh, and changed and adapted, um, someone should, should should pay for that, and in many cases it really ought to be government and is actually better for the overall ecosystem in, in, in the long run uh, to part with or partner with organizations who can do that. So I think it's entirely reasonable for nonprofits to ask government for money. At the same time, government very much is interested in lots of different kinds of business models for sustainability, and sometimes signing, signing a contract helps us to say what we'll do on our, on our end of the bargain over time. Anyone for a final question? No, then we'll wrap up and let's just um, thank our three speakers again.